welcome you to a time of study. There are more people studying the Word of God today than ever before in the history of the world. That's very exciting, you know. Wherever you go on the face of this earth today, people are re-examining the Word of God. I mean scientists, uh, uh, doctors, attorneys, uh, statesmen, they are re-examining the Word of God, and that's very exciting. And we are re-examining our great truth, and that is related to the altars and the sacrifices of the Most High. Uh, this came about through a lady asking me a question in my question and answer period time in my teaching hour, that what's the difference between the offerings, the burnt offering, the sin offering, and so forth, and I said, well, I'd be glad to tell you. I'd rather just tell everybody while I'm at it. And that's what we're doing at this time. Uh, it all began in the Garden of Eden uh, when Adam and Eve had fell into, uh, into sin and into rebellion and had found themselves ostracized uh, from the uh, place in God that they did have. Then uh, God took an animal or two animals and... and, and uh, took their lives, and through that gave them coats of skin uh, to wear. And they saw it. They, they, they were looking at it and saw it. And so they come to know that for transgression you needed a covering and, and that the innocent uh, will, will suffer for the guilty, which was the most magnificent emblem of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. And so actually Calvary is seen from Genesis chapter 3 right straight through until it happened on Golgotha, outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, in the study that we have precisely for today, we are studying a nation makes an altar and offers an offering uh, to the Most High. Now, we have been studying the birth of these altars and offerings and how they got started, and, and the patriarchs, and we will mention those again today for you. And then we have come to the time when a nation, we have moved from a person uh, to a nation. Here God uh, had his altar uh, for an individual, uh, um, and we will speak about those two, such as Adam and Abel and so forth, to a family relationship, uh, uh, such as Abraham, and, and now they move to a nation. The same type of sacrifice uh, that was good for one was good for a whole nation. The altars of the Most High uh, bore offerings uh, for generations uh, and, and for a family and for a country. In, in Noah's situation, in Genesis chapter 8, uh, Noah built an altar unto the Lord. He took up every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered a burnt offering uh, before the Lord. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And that was a sweet savor offering. And the Lord said unto his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more anything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Now God promised that, you see, and that, and that took place at an altar. The, the, great com, com, the great covenants of God take place at an altar. The great relationships of God take place uh, when man is worshiping. That's very significant for us to know. Then we come to Abraham. And in Genesis 12 and 7, it says, And the Lord, our Jehovah, appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord and appeared that who had appeared unto him. Verse 8 says, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of Jehovah called upon the name of Jehovah. So we find that re relating to the name and relating to the offering and relating to the sacrifice that God was continuing what he had started in the Garden of Eden through those that would love and serve him and, and carry on the work that he had prescribed uh, for them to carry on. We move from Abraham into his son Isaac. and You find that in Genesis chapter 26. It says he went up from thence to Beersheba. This was Isaac. And the Jehovah appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, I am with thee, and I will bless thee and multiply thy seed uh, for my servant Abraham's sake. You see, God loved Abraham, and God would bless his children because of Abraham. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. And so we find from the, the generation of Abraham into the generation of his son, 
They specifically did the same. They made their offerings unto God upon an altar of God. And through this, they had communion with God. They had fellowship with God. And they come to know the power of God and the anointing and the blessing of God through this, you see. And so it became an instrument of relationships with God. Now, that's what the altars and the sacrifices were for. And when Christ came, he became the supreme altar and the supreme sacrifice, once for all, not to be redone every year. And, and so uh, that's the story of the Bible, really, the story of the altars and the sacrifices unto the Most High God. We go a generation further, and in Genesis chapter 36, we come to a man named Jacob. And God said unto Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel. Now, Abraham had been there, and Isaac had been there, and, and now we find a young man named Jacob going there. And, and dwell there, and make thee an altar unto Jehovah there, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Verse 2 says, Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you. He knew they shouldn't have idols. And be clean, and change your garments, and let us rise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar, you see, an altar unto Jehovah, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way in which I went. And so here we find uh, God dealing uh, precisely with man, uh, with a person, and with his household. But this law of altars and sacrifices tr tremendously changed at this point until a man did not offer his own offering in his own little place <laughs> anymore. The altar was to be for the nation. Uh, there was to be no sacrifice. It was to be offered anywhere else except in God's place, and that was Jerusalem. All offerings moved to Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? What a change, what a remarkable change when God was dealing with persons and then when he started dealing with a complete nation at one time. In Leviticus chapter 17, it says, The Lord God spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto thy sons and to all the children of Israel unto them, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded thee, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, the tabernacle of the, of, of the congregation, and bringeth it not into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood shall be imputed upon that man, uh, he has shed blood, that man should be cut off from among his people. And to the end, that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, as a nation, you see, bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even they may bring them unto the Lord, under the tabernacle. They were bringing this under the tabernacle of the congregation, under the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto the Lord. You see, the, the, the tabernacle of God was becoming the, the, the solitary place where the offering was to be offered, not on any hilltop and not as you pleased, uh, but in a certain specific place. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle on the, of the congregation, and the burn the fat for a sweet savor unto Jehovah. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. It's amazing how quickly people slip away from God. It's amazing. God had done so much for that nation, and yet they had gone out after false gods already after whom they have been gone a-whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. And thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man uh, shall be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn among you, that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. Now that shows you, I mentioned twice in this reading, that the offerings were now to be in God's temple, in God's tabernacle, by God's high priest, and not by anyone else. So God had moved from dealing with an individual uh, like, like Abel, or like Noah, or like, or like Jacob, or like, uh, like these others, into a nation. Uh, the, the offerings were not to be uh, per person, but in the, and were to be offered up in a specific place in the tabernacle of the Most High God. This was a place where God would meet with the sinner, and this was a place where God would accept his offerings, and, and therefore an entire nation, an entire nation went up to the capital city of Jerusalem to worship the Most High God. God chose Jerusalem as the place of his tabernacle, as the place of worship, and that's where the entire country was to go up and to worship God in that, in that sacred place. It became the capital city of the new nation, 
and it became the, the central place of worship uh, for the people of Israel as they worshiped the Most High God. One sacrifice could suffice for a total congregation of Israel, and not just for a person or for a family, as we had seen before. The laws relating to altars and sacrifices and the offerings were written out and documented at Sinai, at Mount Sinai, through Moses for the entire nation. We read in that book of Leviticus, as I was telling you about it, in chapter 7, uh, verse 38, which the Lord commanded Moses at Mount Sinai on the day that he commanded the children of Israel to offer the oblations unto the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. It was there in the wilderness that Moses received the word from the Lord that they were to offer these offerings for the nation and not for particular persons, but for a nation. The nation of Israel were God's people. They were his church in the wilderness. And now God would be dealing with a nation and not just with a single person uh, anymore. And in Acts chapter 7 and verse 38, it says, uh, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to Moses in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living oracles to give unto us. That's in Acts chapter 7 and verse 38 where the New Testament tells us that these are the living oracles, the living truths, the living words of the, of the living God uh, to tell them how to worship or when to worship and, and, and all about it. And, and this was their personal relationship to Jehovah, uh, the, the living God. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 9, it says, For the Lord's portion is His people. Isn't that great? The Lord's portion is his people. Uh, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. That means the whole uh, uh, of Jacob uh, with the 12 tribes and with the nation of Israel. Uh, verse 10 says, he found uh, him in a desert land. That was when they were out by Mount Sinai and God gave him the, the law. And in the waste howling wilderness, <laughs> God's reminding him of where he found his salvation at and where he was led. He was led about. Uh, and he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. And so he's showing you how God transferred uh, the making of altars and offering of sacrifices from an individual to a nation. And, and, uh, and, and today it's altogether different again. The Lord Jesus Christ became not for a nation, but for a world. You know, not, he didn't, we don't make an offering for a nation. He made it, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so it moved to a further and greater dimension than it ever had before. Isn't that exciting? That is just truly exciting all the way down inside. Now, the national altar had two parts. We may not be able to get to both parts of them today, but we certainly will in our next lesson. Uh, so just stick real close to us as we are studying uh, the altars and the offerings unto the Most High God. And in this particular lesson, we're showing how a nation makes an altar and an offering unto God, not an individual, but for a nation. Now, in Israel and in the holy place and, and in, the, in the house of God, there was what was called the, the brazen altar. It was called the brazen altar because it was made of metal. It was made of brass. It, it shined very brightly. And this was out in the open where, where people could see it. And it was the altar where sins were taken away. Let's read about it together. Open your Bibles there to Exodus uh, chapter 27. Let us begin in verse 1. Thou shalt make an altar of, of shittim wood, five cubits long, five cubits broad, and the altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. Thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. The horns shall be the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. That's where they call it the brazen altar. And thou shalt make it, make it plain to receive the uh, pans, to receive the ashes, and shovels, and basins, and flesh hooks, and fire pans. All the vessels thereof shall be made of brass. It was the brazen altar where sins will be forgiven. And thou shalt make it for a great uh, of network of brass, and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. Every detail was put in there. Verse 5 says, And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves uh, for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. Even the handles by which they carried this before it rested in the temple of God uh, were also brass. 
and the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. That's when it had no uh, permanent place when they were moving in the wilderness before they put it into Jerusalem. And it, and it says in verse 8, A hollow with boards shalt thou make it as it was showed thee in the mountain, so shalt thou make it. Uh, there, the God was given the prescription. It had to be that way. It could not be any other way. And God said, it must be the way that I want you to do it. In Exodus chapter 38 and verse 30, it says, And therewith he made the sockets uh, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the brazen altar, the brazen altar that stood in the midst of the, uh, the congregation there, and the brazen grate for it, and all the vessels of the altar. And so it was made exactly like God told Moses that it should be made. This altar stood in the outer court, as I've told you in another lesson. You find that in Exodus 40 and verse 6. Thou shalt set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Now that meant when you walked into the door where you worship God, the first thing was the altar. And it was the brazen altar uh, that was there. It stood in the outer court. It was for the remission of sins, and everybody, everybody was to see it. It wasn't a hidden thing. And uh, the other altar we'll be telling you about a little later, the golden altar, was in another place altogether for a different purpose. In Numbers 15, chapter 15, and verse 14, the Word of God says, And if a stranger sojourn with you, or whosoever he be among you in your congregation, in your generations, and will offer an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord, as ye do, so he shall do. Now, isn't that something? That if, that, if, that, that if a stranger comes to live with you, and he's a heathen, and if he believes in your God, you can convert him over to your God. And, and God says a stranger uh, has a right. The foreigner has a right to serve the same God that you have. And so uh, Calvary is not new, and the worldwide salvation is not new. It's been from times immemorial that God does love everybody. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. In verse 15, uh, that numbers uh, 15 that we're reading from, the one ordinance shall be both for you and for the congregation, and also for the stranger. You see, there's to be no difference. Your sin, the congregation's sin, or the foreigner's sin was all the same thing as far as God was concerned. God had no pets, and God had nobody uh, that he was uh, better to than he was to somebody else. Uh, and he's the same today. He is exactly the same today. It don't matter who you are. If you're Korean, or if you're Chinese, or you're Japanese, or you're Indonesian, it makes no difference with God. Uh, everyone comes exactly uh, the same way. Uh, the, uh, the stranger that uh, sojourns with you, an ordinance forever in your generations, as ye are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. That's beautiful of the Lord to say that. One law, verse 16, one law and one manner shall be for you and, and for the stranger, and that sojourneth with you. God made that so plain until you couldn't miss it, you see. <laughs> when God says the same thing about three times, you know he means it. He's really getting to you. Now, it says the brazen altar was the first object that one, a furniture that one would see when he entered the place of worship, into the tabernacle or into the temple. And uh, when a person went entered there, he was in what they call the outer court. It's sometimes called the Gentiles court, uh, of the outer of the temple. And this altar reveals that Christ must be the first object. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, way back before Christ, how perfect it was. Must be the first object that one sees when he comes to worship. Not something else. Not the golden altar <laughs> of beauty and loveliness and, and fragrance. No. But, but the, the brazen altar where, where sins were forgiven, where, where men were cleansed from their sins, uh, that was the first thing he was to see. And only his sacrifice could save him. Only his sacrifice could save him. Nothing else. He could come and say, oh, I, 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 I am a German, or I am a Frenchman, or I am an Englishman. Uh, God says, no, 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 you're all sinners. Uh, the, the, he was not permitted to do that. I'm a good man. I pay my debts and so forth. No, God said, there's only one way to come, and that's to bring your offering right to this altar. Whether you were uh, Israeli or, or wh whatever you were, it was all the same. <clears throat> he says, and the Christ was the first one that you see, and this was the only way of salvation. There was no other. Only priests could go beyond this altar uh, into the temple proper. Only priests. That, that right here is where there was a breakdown uh, in this whole situation. Only the priests could go further. Under the new covenant, all Christians are priests, so we can all go in.
Revelation 1 and 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness of the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our own sins and made us. Now, you ought to read that. It's in verse 6, and it's in Revelation uh, ver chapter 1, the first chapter of the book of Revelation. And in verse 6, He hath made us to be kings and priests. Uh, made us. We, we are today a very significant person. We that are redeemed and we that are saved are very significant persons. Uh, we are kings and priests under, the, under God and to our Father. And to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Uh, under the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so let us look again at this brazen altar. Every worshiper must bring a sacrifice uh, for his own offering. In this central place in Jerusalem, where it's offered for the whole nation. Everybody could come at that same place. In Hebrews 9 and, and 22, it says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission for sin. There is no remission without blood. And so the only way that one could be saved, the only way that one could come to a knowledge of God, the only one way that one could receive eternal life was to come and be purged at the altar for forgiveness of sin. When you committed sin, you, you, had no, uh, you had no choice. You couldn't say, well, I'll do this or I'll do that, I'll do the other. God said you had to go to Jerusalem. You had to offer your offering unto Him. And if it was accepted of Him, uh, then you would be saved, you see. And so it was a thing, not if you wanted to. It was a thing that they had to do it in order to be saved. Now, it's the same today. Uh, there are people that would like to get to heaven many other ways. The occultists would like to get there one way. And, and the people that, uh, that, uh, that are doing their meditation work would like to get there another way. Now, the Bible says, and you have to believe it or not believe it. I believe it. The Bible says that there is no other way. Christ says, I am the door. And if you do not come in through Christ, you can't get in. Jesus himself said, anyone that tries to get into heaven any other way except through him, the same as a thief and a robber. And so you cannot get to heaven any other way excepting through him. Why don't you accept that way today? and let the Lord Jesus Christ become the King of your life, the Savior of your soul. He wants to, He's willing to, and He's ready to right now if you will receive Him. So the sacrifice in Deuteronomy 17 and 1 is very important. Thou shalt not sacrifice unto the Lord thy God any bullock or sheep where therein there is a blemish, a blemish, or any evil favoredness, any cripple, or any, anything that's of, uh, uh, that they, is uh, abnormal, for that is an abomination unto the Lord. Now, if you want to make a sacrifice to God, you don't give God your castaways. <laughs> yeah. If you've gotten tired of something and weary of something and don't want it around, say, so, well, I give it to God, uh, He will not accept it. God comes first, or He doesn't come at all. And, and so if you wish to bring an offering unto God, you must bring your best unto Him. Uh, or he can't receive you otherwise. And if you think you're fooling God, you're fooling nobody but yourself. God does not accept selfishness. He will not accept it. If you love yourself better, than, better than, than you do God, that's the same problem he had with Lucifer up in heaven, that Lucifer loved himself more than he loved God, and he had to be removed from the presence of God because God was not first in his life. And you will have to be forever removed from the presence of God if God is not first in your life. I want to urge you to make God first in your life. I want to urge you to let Jesus Christ, the Son of God, become the number one person in your heart and your life. Won't you do it? Won't you do it right now? God is looking for you. He's waiting for you. He wants you to. And He is right now reaching with outstretched arms to say to you, whatever you've done, come to the true sacrifice of the ages. Come to the true altar of all time. That altar is Calvary. And Christ is the offering. It was in it was in shadows, and it was in, uh, in types, and it was in all kinds of beautiful replicas beforehand. But in Calvary, it is consummated. He once and for all gave himself to save you, to bless you, to help you. Won't you receive him today? Won't you receive him right now? Won't you make him the king of your life? Won't you make him glorious right now? Please do. Don't, don't say, I'll do it on Sunday at church. Don't do that. Do it right now. The Lord Jesus is welcoming you into fellowship, blessing, and everlasting life. May I bless you. Father, these words have been spoken as truth, and they must bore into the hearts and lives of these friends so that they will know the truth of God, 
Lord, bless them, we pray. Please do. Please bless them, Lord. We ask you to bless them right now and let each one know you of a truth and know you by your mighty power and give unto God that which will be pleasing in the sight of God. Let our offering be acceptable into thee, unto thee, O Lord, because of the greatness of what you've done for us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for it. And God bless you. We believe God for it.